when I looked at the truth of that, um, it was like, wow, this is everywhere, and this isn't going to be easy. But I also knew it was going to be very worthwhile. So we're going to talk today about honesty and really what that means. And I, just to kind of have us think about how it applies in the workplace, I want you to ask yourself this question. When someone says or does something that you find hurtful, offensive, or inappropriate, do you handle it? You know, there's several ways to handle that kind of a situation. First of all, we have to make an immediate assessment of where we are who's around us, what circumstances we're in, and who the person is that just said that. Because you see, addressing these kinds of things requires our energy. And so if we're really going to be honest with someone, that's a whole lot different than how we usually are. Because we're used to going, hi, how are you? Fine, thanks. And you, you know, this very superficial way of communicating to people. Or we have this, what I call negative bonding. You know, we hang around the water cooler and talk about people and have a little clicks. And, you, you know, when you walk through that area and in work, you kind of feel, ooh, that awful icy here. Are you feeling uncomfortable? Or when someone says something that's really offensive, you know, do you react in anger? Well, depending on what period of my life we're looking at, yeah, I act in anger. Yeah, I could have screamed and hollered or got up and shoved you and pushed you. And, you know, when I was a teenager, I got tired of being a victim, so I became very aggressive when this kind of, someone hurt me, if someone offended me or made fun of me, or I thought it was inappropriate. And that's okay at, at some times and some places, but when we're in the workplace, interesting thing that happens in the workplace is our family dynamics get acted out. You know, someone becomes mom, someone becomes dad, someone becomes whoever. And we find ourselves behaving that way. And it's kind of like the same thing, you know, when you go home to your parents' house, within five minutes you kind of slot yourself into this age, whether it's seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and you start looking through that eye set again. Same thing can happen at work when somebody says something. I'm going to give a little example. I had a, uh, someone email me over the weekend and was just profoundly hurt by someone had come into their office after they had done them a favor and asked if they could speak to them privately. And so they closed the door and, you know, this person said, you know, you're awfully overweight. Why is that? And proceeded to pass judgment on this person and tell them what to do. Now, of course, this was a very fit person, someone who was tall and lean and, you know, really did a lot of running, was raised with that kind of, or took possession of that kind of way of thinking and just destroyed this person. So I was contacted how to deal with that. I have several responses to that. See, to get in an argument with someone is to feel you have to defend yourself so you don't bother doing that. To not say anything is kind of a hold on to it. So it's not yours unless you make it yours, unless you keep it. And it's nothing you have to be mad about because when we say things about other people, we're just reflecting our inner belief system, same as when they say something about us. So a really appropriate and really good way is to say, why are you, why are you saying this? And to lob it back to them. Because if that's not appropriate. It's never appropriate. It's never kind. It's never beneficial. It never contributes to anything other than a form of bullying that's been disguised under honest critiquing. It's never effective. But you can't hold it because then it becomes yours. And if you've done it, as soon as you recognize you've done it, you must go and get that ball and take it back. So being honest, really being honest means that when someone hurts your feelings, you're going to have to deal with your own stuff the part of you that wants to cry, wants to lash out in whatever form that is, wants to storm out of the room, wants to silently sleep out, wants to fade into the woodwork, whatever it is you honestly do around that, and then recognize that it's best for you that you honestly deal with that in a way that says, that's not mine, that's yours. 
and not through being right and wrong, but to simply not take on what's not yours and to not fight it. Much easier said than done, but so, so, so rewarding. Because the kind of person that does that um, really has a hard time with this next slide, and that's the truth. You see, a person who judges someone else, and we all know that person because we've all been that person, does so out of a place of fear, does so out of a place of feeling less than. So like the crabs in the bucket, they're looking for somehow, some way to feel better about themselves, but unfortunately it's at the expense of someone else, either through the silent judgment that we do when we look at someone and we think, oh my God, this, don't own a mirror, you know, or oh, you're kidding, right? You have no idea what you, you know, we do this all the time, we judge. It's a primal brain function. It's a necessary function. To not want to do it is like to not want to breathe. It just happens. And this comes from a very primordial uh, fight or flight response from the brain stem, from that primal vein, brain part. We look at someone and we have to judge immediately, friend or foe, fight or flight, you know, it's, it's survival. Now it requires a whole different set of skills because we just can't do that, which is why we zone out and we put headphones in and we do all kinds of things to distract ourselves from all of that that's going on in our brain. In order to do that, you've got to live in your truth. You see, to deal with that situation there, the truth of the matter is you have to acknowledge almost immediately to yourself, like, oh, that really hurt. And that it's poked a stick at all your other wounds that you may have had around that, you see, because it would have to bother you for it to have an effect on you. So chances are this person was called names before. Chances are when you're at work and your work is criticized, there was someone in your life who always made you feel that no matter what you did, you could never, you could ne it was never going to be enough. So that gets a, a stick plugged at it. And your truth is, is that you're going to have a response to this kind of situation. And it's not your job to tell the other person what your response is. What is your job is to deal with your response. You know, if you're feeling hurt, well then, okay, what happens when you feel hurt? Do you get defensive on getting angry? This really pisses me off. For example, for me, when I'm really angry, I can't speak right away. Because I've learned not to be physical, but my tongue could probably slice you up into itty bitty pieces and leave you lying on the floor before you knew what hit you. And that, hurts, that serves no one. All that is is my fear lashing out. I'm trying to hurt you in retaliation, and you may not even be aware that you've hurt me. So the truth that we're speaking about when we speak about working with the seven grandmother grandfathers is the truth about who we are. We all come to the circle of life and to the circle in the workplace with the truth about ourselves based on our teaching ground, which is our childhood. We all come to the circle of life believing things about us that might not even be our own beliefs. And so when someone criticizes you, listen to what your mind says to you. Be aware of how your body responds to that. What's the first thing you feel you have to do? And that's where you know where to begin to work with that. And so if it's to lash out, then it's to be quiet. If it's to be quiet, then what is it you would really like to say and help yourself learn to say that? The truth is maybe this isn't yours. That's just that person. And you don't need to hold up the you're wrong, I'm right kind of sign either. You know, one of the teachings that uh, I use often is that, you know, part of being Aboriginal, we're connected to all things, like this beautiful picture of the floor, forest is, is not just the picture of the forest. These are the tree people. These are the plant people. And they've come here for us to work with them and for them to work with us. And if a squirrel was to scamper across that path right now, our way is to go, oh, I wonder why that squirrel has come to me today. Am I scattered? Am I not putting enough away? It's the same thing when someone scampers across your path who criticizes you. The response may be to be defensive or attacking, but it should be to help yourself. It, it might, it's more helpful to say, hmm, why is this person criticizing me on this today? How does this impact me? And all the time remembering not to hold on to it. 
because it's also their criticism of themselves. And the truth of the matter is, is that when two people engage in a conversation, they have invisible stuff between them. They have your stuff, they have their stuff. Now in the workplace, there winds up being a lot of stuff around. And sometimes we trip over someone else's stuff. And the truth is, if we know what our stuff is, then we can help ourselves respond in the workplace in a way that contributes to the health. Saying, instead of saying, well, the heck's the matter with you, they'll say, well, okay, when I criticize outside, it's because I feel I'm not, I'm not doing enough. I'm feeling less than, there must be stress. You know, Dr. Phil, you either love him or hate him, and sometimes I do both, but he said one time when I was watching the show, because I, I, I was one of those people, uh, people behind the wheel, like I, I didn't realize that getting into my car, and then I got on my high ho- horse, and I would giddy up down the highway, uh, you know, the Don Valley Parkway, and, and really say, well, who are you? You just cut me off. You're like, don't you know who I am? You know, like, a, excuse me, but I'm here too. And he said something to the effect, maybe that person that cut you off is rushing to the hospital to say goodbye to a loved one who's dying. And I was like, oh, oh yeah, the truth of it is when I get behind the privacy of my, we do some weird things. We pick our nose, we do all kinds of things in the car, believing that we're kind of in this little invisibility cloak as we go down the roads and the highway. And the truth is what we are is really with ourselves. And so what you do in the car is really who you are. And what you say in the car when you're all by yourself or anywhere all by yourself is what you really think. You see, because the truth of the matter is we have two faces. One, that we don't show the general public, our loved ones, they're the lucky people. They get to see that, all that ugly side of us, all that stuff we know the rest of the world would never deal with. We have to know the truth of who we are so that we can handle criticism in a way that, you know, we all need to be critiqued. It would have been our, our grandmothers and our aunties who wouldn't have mind telling us what's what and what we needed to improve. We need that. But not when it's abusive, and you can't do it when it's abusive. So this brings us to respect. Do you respect the opinions and the rights of yourself and others? It's much easier to accept and respect the opinions and rights of others than it is of your own. Like most of us, you know, we were never asked our opinion. And if we did give our opinion, lots of times it didn't meet with such a positive thing. And so a lot of times we learned to keep our mouth shut or to say it under our breath or behind your back or some other way because we weren't really taught that we had any rights. And when you're in the workplace, the workplace is designed up kind of like a little mini war zone, you know, where everybody's kind of all competing with each other and I do more work than that person. They get paid more money than me or the boss likes them more. You know, we, we, we tend to have that hyper-villagence because we don't really respect that. What we think and what we do is just as important and just as valuable as everybody else's. And because Bob happens to be a total ass in our mind and has an incredibly different opinion than me, doesn't mean you're right. It just means that that's what Bob thinks, and your opinion of him is your opinion of him. You know, we all have opinions. And so respecting other people doesn't mean that we engage in the battle or that we judge them or that we shame them or that we blame them. It comes from a place of knowing that you yourself have a very different perspective because of your own teaching ground or your own childhood or your own life experiences. You know, you, you're not going to know too much about canoeing, for example, unless you've been in the canoe and done it. You can read a lot of books on it. And you can look at it. But when you get in and do something, it's quite different. So unless we really have had the same experiences as other people, we may have curiosity and a knowing, but what we lack is understanding. We lack the understanding of having walked in someone else's moccasins having been in someone else's life. And so it's also the fundamental thing that was taken from us as Aboriginal people. When the Europeans came over here, you know, in their boats and their well-advanced navigational system, I'm sure they thought they were the only people that had ever gone really far in a boat. We all know that wasn't true. But they came over here and looked at us, you know, they were, they were, had refined clothes and we were quite content to live off the land 
you know, dancing around campfires and smoke the pipe and drum and sing our songs. Imagine all the disrespect that poured out of them. For us, I thought those poor things. Look at them, they're so far behind. We have to be very careful not to do to others what was done to us. So when we get into that place of respect, it's really important to respect what the other person says. It doesn't mean you have to agree or respect that they have a right to say it. Is there somebody there who wants to ask a question or make a comment? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, please feel free to jump in because I can keep on going here until my lips fall off. So you're not going to offend me at all by jumping in and asking for clarity or saying I don't think that would apply or what are you talking about. You know, I'm, I'm just uh, giving to you what it is that I believe um, is important uh, wherever we walk. Okay. So asking yourself, do you respect your own opinion? Do you give your own opinion at work or do you go silent because it may differ than someone else's? You know, are, are you open to someone else saying, well, I don't know if I agree with that and it not being uh, heard as, I don't know if I agree with you. Are you able to separate your opinions from you? That it's just an opinion and it's just someone else's opinion. And they, everybody has to be respected. That's the fundamental of our beliefs. We respect all life. I really got this. I'm going to tell this to you quickly. I really got this. I had to face this very thing about did I respect the people that I was working for. Because I was going into the jail system doing uh, spiritual and emotional circles and helping the guys. And I had two, three circles that I did, two for the main and two for the, the PC population. And I had to face the fact that in the PC population, they were all pedophiles, and I had been abused at the hand of a pedophile. So I never seemed to have enough time left for them to get a full circle. They got a McDonald's drive through version of it. You know, they got the smudging and the prayer and, and, you know, a brief talking about where they were, anything coming up from them in court, but not the in-depth stuff. And that wasn't sitting right with me. And I had to, I had to face a truth that I really believe that the Creator created all of us and with a purpose like that squirrel in the path. And my answer was yes. Yeah. And then I realized I had to get off my high horse and, and recognize that, you know, our traditional way is everyone's a part of the circle of life. So he created the rapist, the murderer, and the pedophile because they have many powerful teachings for us. They remind us of what's right and what's wrong. They remind us of how not to be. They remind us about justice and fairness. And so, like the alligator who, you know, I wouldn't be too thrilled to go for a dance with, I, I, I might not be too thrilled to go for a dance with some of these other people, but I had to either respect that they were creator's creation and put my thoughts and opinions out of it and do my work, or I had to leave. And that's what I mean about these words, to become a way of living. And so I was challenged, as we all are and should on a regular basis, what do we respect? What do we give our time and energy to? Is it our career? Is it our family? Is it our conversation? Love. Love, uh, I mean, it can mean so many things, but in this context, and uh, there's the innocence of that happy little child up there. But do you gossip and talk negatively about your coworkers and superiors? And remember, I had mentioned a little earlier about how we negative bond. You know, we, um, it's like, you know, whenever you go to the workplace, I always find the first person that approaches me is probably like when you go to a bar, the losers who uh, have already been rejected, they approach you first, you know, like, it's almost like, quick, I want to tell you how wonderful I am before everybody tells you what they think about me. And so, you know, I can tell you right now I'm a brain surgeon, only time would tell you that I'm not. And so it takes time for us to get to know people. And when you negative talk or gossip about your coworkers or your supervisor or even about yourself, a lot of people have a lot of negative thought, self-talk, a lot of derogatory, defaming self-talk. When you do that, you're contaminating that whole environment because those thoughts are not loving. It doesn't mean you have to walk in there and say, well, I am the greatest thing since sliced bread and you're going to be really happy that I'm here. That's not about it. It's about recognizing once again that circle. 
You know, our circle, we, we sit in a circle at meetings, we sit in a, a circle at very important things because it's a very conscious effort to remind ourselves no one above, no one below, no one in front, no one behind, that we all come to the circle of life with something equally valuable to offer. I mean, everybody's going to agree with it, but it's just your experience. It's just as important as someone else's experience. And someone else's experience is just as important as yours. And when you hear you thinking or talking negatively about other people, that's just your projection of what you, what you believe about self. It's just your fear talking. It's just that other person's fear talking. You hear somebody say, oh, my God, did you see her today or did you see him today? Who do they think they are every time? When you're focusing on somebody else, we're actually kind of taking a break from focusing on ourselves because we really can't control anybody else. I spent a lot of years grabbing a hold of the reins of the universe and wanting it to really line up with my, my way of thinking. And I did a lot of judging and a lot of negative talk. It took me a long time to recognize I've been raised by such negative people. I didn't know how to connect with people any other way. But when I did get that, it changed my whole work relationship. I've had to work with some people I did not like at all. I didn't like their personality. I didn't like how they treated me. But you know, I really respected their work. And that's a very humbling thing when we realize it's not our job to make everyone like us and it's not our job to like everyone. But what does make for a better life and a better workplace is when we learn to behave in a loving manner through not gossiping and not pointing out the negativity, but just letting someone be, letting yourself be. You know, we're not perfect. We all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And you're only as strong as in your sense of self about the weakest thing you have that you pass judgment on. You know, we, we have to learn to love the differences in life and appreciate the differences in ourselves and with each other. And it really makes a and this is not, you know, holding the hands and skipping down the yellow brick road singing kumbaya ah, kind of workplace I'm talking about. It's about just really not to gossip. Gossip, you know, people buy into these stories. It's a very dra dramatic thing. I work at a place and every time when we go outside for a break, a smudge your lungs kind of break. You know, there was always this one woman who was talking so negative about white people all the time. Oh, we're talking about, you know, like, I mean, I could repeat it, but it's not necessary. We've all heard it. it. used to drive me crazy. And one day I just finally said to her, where do you put your white mother in all of this hatred? And she kind of looked at me, and that was the end of her talking about that. Because you see, there's some of us that when we come back to the native way of being, we dive into the what I call diving into the native pool, you know? We just only honor that side of us that's, that's Indian, and we grow our hair, and we wear beaded stuff, and we start to braid it, and we go to powwow, and we take ceremony, and we become. And then, you know, you come out on the other side, as I did, and I realized, hmm, well, my grown daughter said to me, so now what do we do with Christmas? But the creator brought these Christian teachings to us because they're pretty powerful. Christ, the, the man's a pretty loving guy. He doesn't judge anybody. He said, hey, 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 you can't throw a stone at the prostitute unless you're sin-free yourself. What do you mean you're leaving these people over here who need us the most, these lepers, to die? How dare you be rich when people outside are starving with no place? Don't pay taxes to Pontius Pilate. You know, they're fueling his war against you. He came from a place of love, and our traditional teachings come from a place of love and acceptance. So when you can walk with that, it sure makes your life a lot more pleasant, and it certainly makes your workplace a lot more pleasant. And it's not about changing everybody else. It's just changing your focus. Courage and bravery. Are you encouraging or disencouraging to yourself and others? Kind of a continuation of that. You know, sometimes it takes a lot of bravery and courage in the workplace to just 
deadpan someone, look at them blankly and turn around and walk away when they said something totally inappropriate. We call that traditionally shunning. We turned our back on the person. We didn't engage in conversation. We didn't try to tell them how wrong they were. Our actions spoke volumes. Sometimes it takes a lot of courage to do that. Sometimes it takes a tremendous amount of courage and bravery to walk back and say, you know what I, what I said there yesterday? Boy, was that, that was really inappropriate. You know, I, I had no right to say that. It also takes a lot of courage to say to the other person who may have said it to you, why did you just say that? So bravery and courage is, you know, it's something that we have to learn to foster. We have to learn to mentor within ourselves. Because courage and bravery, it simply means to be afraid and to do it anyway. But to do it in a good way. To do it in a good way. You see, when you can't say no, then your yes really means nothing. And when you're really worried about what other people think about you, boy, the workplace is the breeding ground for that one to run amok. Because then you're trying to be everything for everybody. And then that feeds your belief that you're not good enough. And so we have to find the courage to say no. Can you do this for me? No. Sorry. And we say that a lot in Canada, but I don't know if you want to add something else instead of sorry, go ahead. Uh, but it should be positive and not derogatory. But no is a complete answer. It requires no explanation. When I was breaking myself of that, I had to make an awful lot of phone calls and say, remember when I said last week that I would do this for you Friday? I don't know if come Friday I'm going to want to, so can I get back to you on Friday morning about that? And if you take something on, if somebody asks you to do something at work, take it on with generosity and the courage to either to do the very best that you can. And when you find yourself saying, I, why did I do this? Say, because I agreed to do this. Don't feed the negativity that it can produce. And then you will learn to cut yourself some slack. Humility. Are you a good team player? Do you feel like you always have to have the answers and show what you know? It's like that, you know, the guy is insecure and wants to be a doctor and then goes to university and spends seven years telling the university how much he knows about medicine. He's not a very good student. And when we're with more than one person, we have the opportunity to give and to receive. And being a good team player means that you're a good team player. And so when you do something well, it's very seldom is it solely you that there's been other people that have contributed. And it's really important that you remember that. Oh, thanks very much, but you know, it wasn't just me, so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so. And you don't always have to prove what you know. Just, you know, just what you do will prove what you know. Being humble means remembering that circle of life just because you can do something really really well doesn't mean that you're better than anybody else because somebody over there can do something else really really well and in our traditional ways we knew who the medicine people were we knew who the best hunter was in the group we knew the people who could put that pp up in about 10 15 minutes as opposed to 20 and someone else could do. and we all knew that we were important so there was no place to be better than Healthy competition helps us hone our skills, but we must recognize and honor that we all have something valuable and worthwhile that we bring to the workplace. Everybody's there doing the work that you're doing for the same reasons that you're doing it, because they want a paycheck. Hopefully, they're doing it because they love it. Hopefully, they're doing it because they feel good about the work that they do. And hopefully they're doing it because it, it's helping them afford the quality of life that they want to have. Not because they're doing it for fame and recognition. A job well done will get fame and recognition. It will just get fame and recognition in and of itself. And it is that if it doesn't, you shouldn't be working for that anyway. So you should be working because it makes you feel good. And if you're not, then maybe it's a really good time to take a look at what you're doing and really follow your dreams. I'm very lucky. Sometimes I, I, I have to pinch myself because I get paid to be me. 
you can't get much better than that. You know, you could come over and sit in my living room and I'd probably get in, you talk about the seven grandfathers, we'd probably have this kind of conversation. But it would be much more enriched because it would be too late. And the last and the most important one is wisdom. How would you like to work with someone who has your personality? Uh, I want you to really think about that. You've got to know yourself. Like for example, if you're a control freak when you're stressed and it's, you find it much easier to do it yourself than to tell anybody else, then you're going to walk over a lot of people in a day because my guess is you're always stressed because you're trying to live off of that. I know I did. The wisdom here is to really know who you are and what it is you do. I call it the three A's. You have to have awareness. That's understanding what it is you do. And let's go back to the example of control freak. All right, I'm a control freak. I understand what a control freak is. The acceptance part is what do you look like when you're a control freak. What do you think? What do you speak? What do you wear? How do you behave? How do you talk? And then what action do you want to take on that? Because I can tell you that we do things that we would probably never accept from someone else. And so your job is to ask yourself, to garner that kind of wisdom from your life so that you feel good about who you are at the end of the day, even in front of the person that you dislike the most, because they have just as much right to be there. And your job is to find a way to be the very best that you can be and do the very best job you can do, because that's what you should be doing when you're going to work. It doesn't mean you're doing it 70 hours a week and getting paid for 40. So these seven words, these seven words can be applied to you in many, many ways. But having the courage to take a look at those first three, having enough honesty to take an honest look at the truth of who you really are is kind of like that caterpillar coming out of the cocoon. It's going to change how you see your life. It's really been a pleasure. I'm, I'm, it's kind of a weird experience to kind of talk into my computer screen and know that there are people there hearing. I can't read your face. I don't know if you've fallen asleep, you kind of drifted off or whatever. <laughs> I'm hoping that it works. And um, if you have any questions, now's a good time to ask them. So for those of you who are listening by phone, we just have a poll that came down. And the question is, how would you rate your workplace's current incorporation of cultural teachings? So one is low, and it goes to seven, which is high. So I think everybody completed answering. So we have 50% who would say five, which is closer to high. And then we have 25% uh, that are one at low and 25% that are at two. We have another question. So you will be receiving a webinar evaluation. It's very helpful for you to fill these out because then we can have some feedback on how you perceive the information and if it has helped you. Did I get a chance to ask anything? Yep, now is the time for group discussion. So if any of you have any questions that you'd like to bring up to Joanne, this is a great time to do it. So you can unmute your line and come and join us. I have a question for you, Joanne, actually, because um, we talk about gossip a lot, I find, um, you know, in our workplace and with our friends and everything, but I, I think the people who gossip don't really know the definition and probably aren't aware that they are gossiping. I, I find that some people justify their actions within, you know, they're just talking about stuff. So can we maybe define what gossip is and, and what the healthy and the unhealthy uh, conversation is? Gossip is saying something about someone when they're not there that you wouldn't say to their face, plain and simple. Okay. And so we all know whether we gossip or not. Okay. That, I think that's probably the simplest definition that we can have. Yes. Um, does anyone else have any question or comment? I do have another question, and it would be about respecting ourselves. Um, I find, uh, for me as a woman and a mother and a, um, a business person, 
trying to uh, work in the community and serve the people and be the mother, be the, the business person. It's, I find it a challenge to know what it is to respect myself. When you have, you're wearing so many different hats and roles and you're, you're, you know, you've got goals that you want to accomplish, sometimes I lose myself in all that. Do you have any comments? Or? Sure. Uh, that's a common thing, especially for uh, parents with children or a very busy life, maybe taking care of their own parents. They often don't have time for themselves. You've got to fill yourself up in the morning. So um, sorry for the bluntness of this, but sometimes the only time we have to ourselves that the whole day is when we're in the morning on, in the bathroom. And so ask yourself how you're feeling, both physically and emotionally, because sometimes you'll have a dream that will stir up some, stir up some emotions. Um, practice the art of deep breathing. That's breathing in through your nose to the count of 10 and blowing out the air like you're blowing out a candle to the count of 12. And when you first do that, you'll get a bit dizzy. That's because you're oxygen deprived. Most of us breathe fear-based. Like if I was to come up behind you and go, every, everybody would go and hold their breath. That's what we do when we're stressed and when we're fear-based. Um, being stressed is a fear-based response to life. So we have to learn to breathe. So every time you go to the bathroom at work, practice that deep breathing. And then make it mindful breathing. Breathe in peace and, and self-trust and breathe out fear and self-doubt. And, and you can breathe in and exhale anything that you want, but make it mindful breathing. Try to practice at some point during your day some active meditation. We're all too busy to sit down and cross-legged. Some people do have that time of luxury and I'm jealous, but most of us don't. So an active meditation is doing something, either walking or something with your hands, like housework, dishes, without any stimuli on. No TV, no cell, no phone, no kids. No, it's just a brief period of time by yourself. Sometimes driving home is a great one. Shut all the external noise off and just learn to value and treasure that time. Otherwise, we go against the, the law, the natural law. When the mother wolf is hungry and she has three or four pups in her den, she can't bow for pizza and she can't go get groceries. She has to go hunt. And like any hunter, she misses a couple of times before she catches. And by the time she catches, she's totally exhausted and hungry. Well, we would take great pride at lugging that carcass home and feeding our kids and sitting around and marrying ourselves. Nature goes, uh, no, I don't think so. And she eats till her belly is full and then she sleeps. And when she wakes up fully rested, then she takes the rest of the carcass home. Why would she be so selfish? Because natural law teaches her that she must take care of herself. Mm. Otherwise, she will not have the energy to fight off predators, to have the patience to be with her children, to not get sick and bring, bring disease back. We are so disconnected from the natural way of living that we've got it all backwards. And then all we do is pass those teachings on by saying to our children, look, you're not important. What everybody else wants from you is what you have to give. And we just continue the disconnection. Wow, that was powerful. Thank you so much, Miigwech, for that. Does anyone else have any questions or comments that you'd like to add? Yeah, I would like to hear how everyone has found this. It's a, a yay or a nay is fine. So to unmute your line, you can do uh, pound, pound six. six. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. I got mixed up earlier. <laughs> she probably corrected me. <laughs> so we have a question coming from Kelly. Okay. I have to say that I always appreciate Joanne's uh, directness. There's no uh, interpretation to be made. It's very straight to the point. So I, I appreciate that because sometimes we need to hear that. It's not always pleasant when it concerns us and it brings consciousness of things that we need to improve, but uh, it's excellent for any type of growth. So Thank you very much for your kind words, Kelly. And, and on that, I would like everyone to know that whatever you see in someone else, you carry. That's if you see something in me and you think, wow, I really like that. That's because you carry that. If you hear something in me and think, I don't like that, that's because you carry that. So we're all just a reflection of everyone. Excellent. So, uh, Lorraine, which question didn't you hear? And she's writing at the moment. Okay. And feel free to unmute your line and, and uh, speak. We can maybe save a couple of minutes. 
stuff as well. I'm talking to you about how. Okay. It's okay. All right. Uh, I really enjoyed the session. I feel that I can share this info in my workplace. Good. I, ho I hope you can. Excellent, because this is, has been recorded and it will be posted on the website uh, uh, shortly, in the next uh, week or so. So you can always send the link to, uh, very discreetly, you can send it to the people you think need to hear it most. <laughs> Maybe you should send it to your whole office and every other organization you know, so then that it doesn't look so, <laughs> so targeted. <laughs> and send yourself a copy at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. We need to check that out. So does anybody else have um, any question or comment? Danielle, I love the fact that you say the gossip topic. I think this is one of the most toxic uh, behaviors that we find in communities and between organizations. So I'm, I'm grateful that you uh, appreciated that. Samson. Samson. Oh, there you okay, so I'd like to say miigwech to all of you for, for spending this time with us um, and uh, enjoying Joanne's teachings and, and uh, her way of expressing the, the seven grandfather, grandmother teachings. Uh, I personally want to thank you, Miigwech. It's always a pleasure of being with you and, and seeing you. And um, please feel free to, uh, to, can they, how can they get a hold of you if they need to? Or? Uh, they, well, you can email me at uh, healingworks at sympatico.ca. Just a minute. We have to have oh. a second. There we go. Yeah, that would help, eh? Healingworks at sympatico.ca. You can also go on my um, website. It's uh, healingworks.ca and uh, getting contact information there. All right, so she's in the Huddle area, or the Ottawa area, for another few months, and unfortunately for us, she's moving back to Toronto, which isn't too far, but we'll definitely stay in touch. Yes, and with these kinds of things, we can always be in touch, so. That's right. Is your email spelled right on the slide? Uh, that, that's my email there. Uh, it may be on the very first one, I believe. Oh, I don't know if that, no, I don't think the information is on there. Okay, but we have it uh, in the chat work. There we go. Healingworks at sympatico.ca. Yeah. So I'd like to invite you all to come to the next webinar, which is April 3rd at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, and it will be about incorporating culture into recreation.